before we break up for our round tables. My name is Alexa Uda. I'm a reporter with the Texas Tribune. We've got a great panel lined up for you, a couple of housekeeping things. We'll do 40 to 45 minutes of conversation up here and leave the rest of the balance for questions from the audience. So if you've got those, um, I'll give you a signal once we're getting close to that, and then we'll have someone with a mic going around um, once we do that. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Next to me, I have State Representative Helen Giddings. She is a Democrat from DeSoto, who has a lot of fans here, who has represented House District 109 since 1993. She is not running for re-election this year. Um, during her tenure, she sat on powerful House committees and served as the chair of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus. Next to her, we have Texas Supreme Court Justice Eva Guzman. Justice Guzman was appointed to the court in 2009 after serving on the Houston-based 14th Court of Appeals. She won re-election to a full term in 2016, and notably, she was the top vote-getter in the 2016 election. There go. Next to her, we have Missy Shorey. She is the chairwoman of the Dallas County Republican Party and executive director of Maggie's List, which is a federal political action committee dedicated to electing conservative women to Congress. And last... Thank you. And last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Margo McClinton Stoglin. She is the Texas State Director of Ignite, <laughs> which is a nonpartisan nonprofit that works to train young women in the Dallas Fort Worth area to be civically engaged in the political process. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Thank you for having us. I want to start off, you know, there's been a lot of talk this election cycle about the unprecedented number of women running for office, particularly running for Congress. Um, but there are still a couple of sobering um, statistics in, in the history of Texas elections. Of the 38 Texans in Congress, only three of them are women. Mm. Only two women sit on the nine-member Texas Supreme Court, and women make up only 20% of the state legislature. Nationally, we rank 35th when it comes to representation. So I want to open it kind of broadly and ask, why is Texas so far behind? I would actually push back and say that we're not so far behind when you consider, because it gets worse, on a national level, we're at 19.8% of the US Congress. And that's before you even decide if you get partisan, if you're Democrat or Republican, but when you put the whole body together. So in the history of the United States, we have had less than 330 women ever elected to Congress. So yes, Texas is, as you say, 35, but this is not like we're so far from the norm. This is an overarching issue that reaches across the bounds there, and it's something that needs to be addressed. Consider 53% of the electorate in the presidential election are women, and yet that is the outcome of who we are choosing to represent us, regardless of party. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of perception, in terms of qualification, in terms of funding, and in terms of, most importantly, step number one, self-selection. Can you do it? And I think we're beginning to see a bit of a crack in that, that barrier. But I just, I just want to point out, don't let, Texas isn't that bad off. We have room to do. <laughs> well, I, I suppose all things are relative. And if you want to compare Texas to the rest of the state, maybe we're not that bad off. But in my mind, Women are sorely underrepresented, and we're in a situation that I find completely and totally uh, unacceptable. And so I think part of the reason is that we have to start to talk to young women at an early age and let them know that this is something they can do. Because one of the things that we find when it comes to elected office is most of the time men simply step out there like Bill Clinton did, whether you like him or not, when he was 16 years old, and he shook the hand of JFK. He said at that moment, I will be president of the United States. Women evolve. We start working with the PTA. Uh, then maybe we go to the school board. Then after that, maybe we go to the city council. And the further off the office is from our home, the less likely we are to be there. Uh, we have to do a better job of helping women understand branding. We have to do a better job of helping women understand messaging. And we have to do a better job of helping women to understand, yes, you can do this. You're just as smart as the men. Just step out there and get on with it. And I'll speak to the 
sort of the judicial aspect of women in office. So nationally, about a third of the judges are women. And that's, that's actually an increase in what it was a couple of decades ago. And if you think about women in the legal profession, you know, the 1980s saw a sea change in women entering the profession. They now make up half of, you know, the, the law students and, and half the lawyers and that sort of thing. But getting women to step up and actually run for office, that's a different question. And, the numbers aren't whether judges are appointed or elected or have these you know, retention elections, the number is the same across the state. So you don't see you know, half the women, half the judges in the country as women. And the other thing I think is you need to make this a priority. So how, however we decide to select our judges, getting women to run, providing the fundraising, providing the support, we need to make it a priority. I know when I was appointed in Houston back in 1999, I was the first Latina. Well, there's still, finally, last year, there's another Latina on the family courts. And then you get to the appellate courts, and now we don't have any Latinos on the appellate courts in Houston. So it needs to be a priority. Are we going to encourage women to run? And if we do, are we going to support them? Yes. And that means giving money. You don't, everybody doesn't have to give $5,000. You can give $100 and make a big difference Absolutely. in a woman's campaign. If you look in Dallas, for instance, there are 31 cities. And there are five cities that do not have one city councilwoman. And then you add 11 cities that only have one city councilwoman. And so when we look at those numbers, there is an issue that we do need more women to file run and not only run but win and we need more representation and that's what ignite does we do start early like representative getting said and we're a nonpartisan nonprofit organization and we talk directly to our young women about why women will not step up fear is number one it is a battle it is a fight i may not agree with the woman sitting next to me i may not agree with the woman uh, on the left of me, but you have to figure out your platform and your issue, and we encourage our young women to think about issues that are important to them, and we help them be able to debate both sides of the aisle. Um, other reasons why women don't want to run is they're afraid of competition, socialization. Mm -hmm. At a very young age, women are relegated naturally sometimes to the kitchen, and men go into the living room and talk politics. Of course that changes, but even sports, being comfortable with winning and losing. It is a battle to go out and win. So we have to start early with talking to our young women about not being afraid, stepping up, and running. Well, I, if I could just add that nothing inspires and encourages women more than seeing another woman who has succeeded. And uh, Dallas County, for instance, there are more African-American female judges in Dallas County than in any county in the country. Uh, and it may have started back with Elizabeth Frizzell, who ran a few years ago. I'm not absolutely certain about that. But Elizabeth ran and lost. And then she had the courage. Uh, uh, yes, I can do that, too. And if I could just take the liberty of comparing the U.S. with South Africa and perhaps with some other countries. Frequently, I take women to uh, South Africa, women legislators, and we all go there with the idea that we're going to show these women how to win elected office. And I go, wait, time out. They need to show you. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> because 50% of the women in South Africa, 50% of the elected officials uh, are women. And it's because women of every party got together and said, no matter what your party is, you're a woman. And you have to go back to the party to make sure that one in four candidates is a woman. And they did that successfully. Think about um, the, the, U, the Texas House in particular, Representative Giddings, during your first legislative session, there were 26 women serving in the House. Um, during last year's legislative session, 24 years later, 
that number went all the way up to 29. Yes. <laughs> I guess we had a peak in 2003 mm -hmm. of 33. And we also had a peak that year in terms of uh, women in the House who chaired uh, committees. And that has fallen as well. I think this is an important area for us to turn our attention to and uh, work on. Because it does make a difference in terms of having a certain perspective and being able to put that perspective on the table. I guess, and, and I wonder, um, for, for all of you really, should we be thinking about this as a recruitment problem or a retention problem, knowing that there have been women who have been successful, but clearly that number sort of peaks and valleys, at least in the Texas House? It's a combination, if you think about it. And so beyond, you know, when you look at Texas, certainly the fact that you have chairmanships, it's all about progression. If you can't progress along in your career, in this case, in your service as a citizen legislator, there becomes a certain point where you know what? We've got other things going on. We've got businesses to run, families to raise, and lives to enjoy, as opposed to being myopic about this. And that is something where we do differ from our male counterparts. One thing I would point out on the chairmanship thing is sometimes there's institutional barriers, okay? So a perfect example is in the U.S. Congress, and I know this may shock you, one of the greatest promoters of women is indeed Paul Ryan. Here's why. Because for a long time, those chairmanships were based on seniority alone. Nothing would move. Now, why are you having all these retirements? Well, if you're not going to be chairman anymore of a very powerful committee, sometimes, you know, maybe hanging out in Congress isn't that much fun anymore. So that's why we have this, we have the open seat here in Congressional District 5. We've got Bunny Pounds running as a woman there. And this is in the Republican primary over there. And you're seeing that across the board. Virginia Fox. A woman who was a janitor to help put herself through college is now the chairman of education and workforce in the US as a PhD. That, and she's the chairman of that committee. That is because when you create an open up opportunity and change the institutions, you then create an option to move forward. And so the more things we can do like that, instead of, because the reality is those, those challenges that you bring up, the fear, the, you know, and, and we're not going to have essentially a quota system in the United States, you know, even though it does occur in other places. This is a way to affect things. And you have to look and say, what can we do to change the structure and the leadership opportunities so that women can step forward on their own merits? And, and I think women can step forward uh, on their own merits. I guess in 2003, we had a record number of women who held uh, the chair's position in, in the Texas House. And I think it was because we did a little bit of what the South African women did. Uh, we got together and we, uh, we said to Speaker Craddock, hey, uh, there are women here who are well informed, who are dedicated, and uh, who quite frankly are as qualified as anybody else to be chairs of this, of this committee. Now, that's a little bit hard to do. Uh, and I'll tell you, because you want to go in there and advocate for yourself, you know? Uh, that's sort of your first priority. And that is sometimes uh, self-defeating in terms of getting more women. In 2003, uh, Tom Craddock uh, named me the chair of business and industry. Uh, he's a very conservative uh, Republican. I'm a Democrat. Uh, the Business and Industry Committee had never had a female, never had an African American uh, to chair it. And so the whole place started trembling. There were actually people who went in to Tom Craddock and said, how in the world can you name her Business and Industry Chair? And his comment was, why shouldn't I? She has been the chairman of the of the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce, 2,000 members, the oldest, largest black chamber of commerce in the country. But not only that, she has been a vice president of the greater Dallas Chamber of Commerce and in charge of all of their leadership positions. She has, in fact, been a high-ranking executive with Sears, Roebuck, and Company, and she now owns a small business. So what's wrong with that? <laughs> Who would be better than that? And because women are coalition builders, 
Uh, and women don't often pat their stuff on the back, so excuse me, I'm going to do it this time. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> business and industry has a lot of important legislation. And I went to my fellow Republican, who was my vice chair, Gary Elkins, and I said, Gary, you and I are going to do something down here that's never been be done before. I said, vice chairs are just ceremonial. The only power they have is what the chair gives them. And I said, I'm going to give you a lot of power because together we are going to make sure that no bill passes out of this committee unless it has a unanimous vote. And he thought I was crazy. Well, for three sessions, every bill that passed out of that committee, except for the uh, tobacco-free restaurants, had a unanimous vote. And we did all kinds of big bills, like overhauling workers' comp, which is very partisan sometimes and very controversial. I want to back up to, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, you mentioned recruitment. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the differences that you see is Men don't have to be recruited. <laughs> they get out early and they start having the conversations with party leadership, either party, start having the conversations with the groups that endorse. After all, you have to get through your primary to make it. And, and you really don't see a lot of leadership coming to women and saying, well, we'd really like you to run against, you know, or for Congress. And so women need to have these conversations all over the state. Who are we, getting, how can we support each other? Who would make a great candidate? Who's got the stamina, because you need it? Who's got the ability to fundraise, because you need it? Who's got the ability to bring people together, because you're going to need some crossover support in order to ultimately prevail? And as women, we need to own the issue. Running in heels is our issue, and we need to own it. And one way is to begin these conversations, begin recruiting women, and then begin deciding that you're going to be the woman that wants to be recruited. And not only recruitment, but creating a pipeline. And you both touched on this. Qualification. Women do not feel like they're qualified. In most political positions, you need to be a resident of that state for, what, six, six months? And then you um, don't even have to have a college degree in many instances. So women don't realize that it does not take a lot to step up and run. Also, we need to ask the question of why. Why do we need more women? Just for women's sake? No. We need women because we do a good job of reaching across the aisle and working together. We care about issues that pertain to us. I sat through the health care panel, and many of you were in this room, when they were discussing many of those issues. If we want things to change, we need to be at the table and making those decisions. And I, 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 Let me just add one other thing, uh, because we're here in, in this building. One of the things that women don't do a good job of is tooting their own horn. Because we have been taught, as a part of our culture, that you know that's just not what you do. And I, I think about this because we are in this building, the Communities Foundation of Texas. And I would dare say that there are probably not five people in this audience, make me wrong, that would know that in 1955, an African-American woman gave two blocks of land in downtown Dallas to what was then the community's chest and two years old. Not only did she give them two blocks of land, she bought the first Red Cross mobile unit in the world and gave hundreds of thousands of dollars in this community. And not only then, but the gift that she gave in 1955 is still here and is still making grants. Now, how many people? here know who that is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're not an employee, how many of you know who that is? If you're not an employee, you work for me, that doesn't, you don't count. So there's one person who knows the name of Pearl C. Anderson. And Pearl C. Anderson did that in a quiet way. She didn't want to make a big noise. She actually is an African American or a biracial person that you couldn't tell was black, went up the service elevator at the Adolphus Hotel to give that gift. And so I say that only to say that example comes to my mind because so often we do those kinds of things and we don't take credit for it. We don't let people know this is what I have done. 
I have a hard time talking. You know, people now, I'm not coming back. They're asking me, well, you know, tell us about what you've done. Texas Tribune asked me that yesterday. And it's kind of like, you know, you don't want to brag, you know, uh, uh, about it. And so that's something that women have to overcome. Well, and know final parts don't struggle with it, do they? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I want to back up to the, to the recruitment process. Oftentimes when I talk to groups that are working to elect women from both parties, really, you hear that, one, women have to be asked to run more than men, and that one of the other biggest challenges is the fundraising component of this, the asking people for money to help you run for office. I'm curious both for our elected officials and those working to elect women, how often, I mean, contextualize that for us, how often is that one of the biggest barriers that we hear from potential candidates, and how many candidates have we lost because of that issue? So I ran, um, I've probably been on the ballot six times. I ran statewide for the first time in 2009 when I was appointed to the Supreme Court of Texas. We served 27 million people. You have nine judges in Austin making decisions that impact 27 million people. Unlike the governor or the lieutenant governor, no one knows who we are. My name is Eva Guzman. No one knows, that. No one knows who we are. And yet we have to be on the same ballot and hope to get the votes that are necessary to get us back into the office, even though I was initially appointed. And I was surprised to learn recently that in judicial races, I was six in the country and raising money. And I thought, how is that possible? I think there's, there's a couple of things that women don't like to do that men have no problem with. And I know this because I've talked to many of the, the, our elected officials that are men. They'll pick up the phone and they'll say, hi, this is you know, so-and-so. And you know, I need 100,000. Can you send that to me? For women, I hated making a phone call. And it was a constant struggle with the financial, the fundraiser that I had hired to help me raise the money. She wanted me to call, and I didn't want to call because I didn't like making. And there are other reasons why judges shouldn't be calling for money besides that. But I think <laughs> in, as a general proposition, women don't like to fundraise. And that's a big part of it. And we need to come to terms with you have to get out into the business community if you're running for a non-judicial office and ask for the money. And it will come, and not everybody will say yes, and some people will turn you away, and you, know, and you, just, you just have to go on to the next one. But I think that's part of it, is learning to ask for the money, just like the men do, and getting that money in your coffers. Here's a helpful tactic on that. Um, the chairwoman of Maggie's List uh, was the first person to ever raise a million, break the million dollar mark in a statewide race in Florida. Okay, she was the first woman ever elected, regardless of party, to Secretary of State of Florida, which if you've been through Florida, if you go kind of side to side, it's almost like Texas. It's a good 12 hours to get across. So from that standpoint, she said, here's the deal. You ask for the money, and then if you get a yes, great, ask for more. If you ask for the money and you get a no, say, that's okay, I'm gonna keep on coming back and asking you until you give me money. And then a tactic that I've used in congressional races as a fundraiser, and I do recommend this if you ever think you're going to run for office, go and be on a campaign and go be the finance chair. Because you're not asking for you, you're asking for someone else. And just get really comfortable with it. And I said, look, here's the deal. You can give now. I'll review and I'd see who would be giving to our opponent. I'd say, you can give and match right now and neutralize that donation because I know you really didn't want to do that, but I understand you've got to for your members. Or we can hold a fundraiser, and I'll tell you right now that the price of admission is going to be whatever that is, twice. I know it's obnoxious, but that's how serious you need to be about the money. Because I will tell you time and time again, if you look at that playing field of candidates in that primary, oh, and if you don't think primaries matter, I voted, OK? 70% um, excuse me, 7% of the Republican electorate determines who are the Republican candidates in Dallas County in midterms. So if you wonder what's going on, that means 93% of Republicans didn't exercise their right to vote. Now, if you think, well, that's Republicans. Well, Democrats, OK, it's at 14%. Again, do the math. Most people aren't even exercising their voice when it comes to that. And number two, you can get a lot of leeway with raising just a small amount of money when you're only affecting that many voters. So those asks are really important. And the more comfortable you get with that ask, the better off you're going to be. Until we, we finish that one off, we will not have parity. We will not be able to bring our unique skill sets to the table. 
because I'm afraid that that's the way it works in politics. And the sooner we get around that, the better off we're all going to be. And I'll add just this on the fundraising arm, but the other component is sort of finding those mentors in politics. Find someone who's run before, maybe somebody who's not running again. How'd you do it? What do you know? Who did you talk to? Can you make a phone call? Can you just open that door for me and I'll, you know, I'll follow up? You're going to need that. It, you know, we want you to self-select, but you can't, it, you're not going to be as successful if you self-select and don't have the other components of the, you know, the, the election process. And one of those is mentors. You've got to, even before you decide to run, get three or four people in your corner. Make sure they're the people that love you the most, that see in you what you don't see in yourself. And they are going to be the ones that are going to help you chart that path because you have to have a path that you're going to follow if you're running for office. And you have to ask what's at stake. It will take us 140 years to reach <laughs> gender parity the rate we're going. And we start at the high school and college level teaching young women to not be afraid for the ask, to make the ask. But more importantly, you have to build your network. It, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, many people talk about it takes five years. So when you have your birthday parties or your baby showers, you're collecting those names. You're collecting information and, and data. And so we ask our young women to get involved, to step up, volunteer on campaigns, build their database and practice and go out and, and make the ask. But it's very clear what's at stake. We have to get more women in office. If, if I could just add, add, and I echo pretty much everything I've heard here, uh, it, it begins and probably ends with money. Uh, you can't convince some people that you're serious if you don't have money. So money has to come early. The one thing that I don't quite agree with based on uh, my personal experience is I am probably one of the most prolific fundraisers in this town for whatever cause you want to name. <laughs> it's no problem for me. I have no problem asking somebody for $100,000 and landing it. Even after 25 years of service, I still have a little bit of trouble picking up the phone and saying, <laughs> Could you get $5,000 to my campaign? You know, I, I, I still have a little bit of a problem with that, even, even today. And so women have to get over that. So go find some other people to help you get over it. I can talk you through it, but I'm not a good example. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked a lot about Congress um, and the state legislature, but I want to talk about um, local elections as well because we know that, um, as we've mentioned, there's a lack of women in a lot of the local city councils in this area. Um, do, we, do women face different challenges when running for local office versus state government? And when we think about solutions, do those differences require unique solutions depending on that geography? Well, I, I think uh, in, in terms of uh, local offices, that's where we sort of end up first. Uh, because we start off uh, close to home and uh, it becomes more difficult generally and we become uh, fewer uh, in, in, in terms of percentages as the further we get away from home. And I think part of that is it, it, it costs less money. <laughs> Uh, to run for these offices uh, close to home, unless, of course, you're talking about uh, the mayor of uh, a large city. And in addition uh, to that, I think when we're close to home, we kind of feel like we can take care of those obligations that our family expects us to take care of. Now, with the young men today that are coming on with the millennials, I think that crowd is going to take more responsibility for picking up the kids after school and getting the kids to the doctor and uh, doing the kinds of things that you can't do if you're in Austin on a regular basis and certainly can't do if you're, if you're in D.C. So I, I, think, I think that's a part of it. But even locally, we have a lot of work to do. I don't know uh, how many of you know uh, that for the first time, in 35 years at the city, at Dallas City Council, we don't have an African American woman in, in 35 years. And uh, we don't have a woman of color at all. And uh, in addition to that, Valetta, we only have two women. Yeah. 
uh, down there. And so that's kind of a little bit of a frightening uh, deal, and I don't know what's going on with that. Do you think about this differently when you're recruiting candidates, whether convincing folks to run locally versus in, to the state legislature or to D.C.? Well, I, I don't think there's any convincing them, okay? So that's the first thing. The main thing is, is that you want to be encouraging. So as party chair, I'll put my ch party chair hat on. I, number one, I'm the first woman to ever serve as the Dallas County Republican chair ever in history. Okay, so that kind of begins to talk about where we've been coming from. And we all need to, and the part, you know what? It was the men who pointed that out. They were the ones that were excited about that, which I thought was really amazing. I was like, really? You're kidding me. It took us this long? That's ridiculous. But when it comes to women recruits, we literally say, hey, what, we're excited to have you run. Many people, you know, there's talk of, are you going to keep a person out of the race? Are you kidding? The more, the merrier. We want everyone to step up. And then when they do, we're going to encourage them to be active campaigners. If they're not strong in a certain suit, let's help them out. I happen to have a PR firm, so let's help you do the communication, whatever the case may be. But ultimately, if that woman doesn't step up and decide that she wants to run or be encouraged by her network and to be funded, and let's get clear, locally, another advantage of some of these races, it costs far less to run. I would argue that the main thing that we want to look at is look at the ballot. Has, who's gone in and early voted and said, whoa, I had no idea there's this many spots on there. And there's so many ways to serve that you could even go there. I mean, precinct chair. How many of you in this room are precinct chairs? OK. We, uh, but seriously, that's wonderful. That is literally the essence of the grassroots. And yes, if you're a precinct chair, you have to walk door to door. But that's where it's at. And so the minute you get comfortable with that, is the minute, I mean, you, th that everything changes. And when you have that bond, I mean, I was out there block walking the other day. I met a woman, it was unbelievable to hear her story. And that's where politics really makes a difference. But in terms of saying, we're only going to recruit women, we're only going to do that, I will say the most important thing is, you have to say as a candidate, yes, I'm going to run. And then here's my viable path forward of how I'm going to win. Because when, when you go to ask that money and you have that little catch in your voice, perhaps, you've got to be, it's, it's a hard ask. It's an absolutely hard ask. But you want to be very clear. Let me tell you the value I'm bringing. Let me tell you the service I'm bringing. And then always think about wh what is your opponent going to do that's better than you? If you think there's six things that they're going to do that's better than you, maybe this isn't the race for you. If you're going to spank them all around and go and show them how to really do things, that's when you're in it for the right reason. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> you got to be that competitive, guys. So, so I, <laughs> I ran in Harris County uh, when I was first on the bench. And um, you know, politics was different than if you're going, even when you're looking at a local race now, you don't have local power brokers anymore. You have mm -hmm. money coming in from all over the state and sometimes all over the country. So the first thing you look at in deciding whether you're going to run you know, in a local race is who are the power brokers? Who's the king maker? Who's the queen maker? We need more queen makers. Who are these people? And how am I going to persuade them that I am the person they should get behind? Because you'll see how these races shake out even locally. Well, you've got you know, 20 people supporting this candidate, and here you are out there by yourself. So the first question is, yet. It's easier to run locally because, generally speaking, there's less decision makers, less power brokers, less people that you need to reach out to. But it doesn't look even how it looked five years ago. Absolutely. You've got to really study the political process in your, lo in your local area, figure that out, and then make a plan and work that plan. And I think that that's just a big part. That's a very important point, and that is something that's changed, as you say, over the last five or six years. Um, I'm not sure we can have a conversation about women in politics today without addressing the Me Too movement, the role of sexual harassment and gender discrimination in politics in particular. I I'm curious what your own experiences, both as elected officials or women working to elect other women, have been with sexual harassment, or even more generally, sort of the boys club that still persists in many aspects of politics? Well, the good old boys club uh, definitely exists. I, I bumped into it first when I became uh, the first female to chair the, uh, the uh, 
Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce in 70 years. Uh, that was kind of interesting because, uh, you know, we made the decisions not so much at the board meeting but at the plush pub down the street. <laughs> and <laughs> even though I've never had a drink in my life, when they went to the plush pub, I went to the plush <laughs> pub. But <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that's, that's how it started with me. And, it, and, and I can very definitely tell you, in the Texas House of Representatives, there is very definitely uh, a good old boys club. Uh, but I think the culture is changing somewhat, and I think maybe it's because women are standing up and women are, are speaking out, and not, not sexual harassment, but the last session uh, we were in a meeting and, and I was standing up saying something. It was a closed door meeting. It was out of the, the uh, earshot of the press. Uh, but uh, there was a guy there that, that spoke very harshly uh, to me. And uh, I was uh, really, um, you know, just inspired and in, in, in about what happened. Because there was another guy that said, no, 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 you come with me now to the person who had spoken harshly to me. And the guy said, I'm just speaking my opinion. He said, no, you come with me now. And when he came back, he apologized. So guys have to take on guys, I think, yeah. in part. And I think the culture is changing because the consequences are changing. Mm -hmm. For so long, this went on. I don't think there's anyone my age who's not experienced harassment at some point, younger too. I mean, but it, it was just part of the culture. But now the consequences are changing. And they're changing because women use their voices. So in order to keep this change, to be this catalyst that, that we've been, women have to keep speaking up. And it's tough to speak up about it. it you know, across industries, and even in the legal profession. you speak up when nothing happens. Even if nobody does anything or no one is held accountable, you have to speak up. I remember working at an institution and this gentleman hit me really hard with his binder on, on my rear. And I just looked at him and said, you should not do that. And I let other colleagues know that he did that. Nothing ever happened. But he never could look me in the eye again. And you practice using your voice. Because you can quickly be silenced. You have to speak up. And we talk to our young women about that over and over again. And that's why it's so important about starting early with young women. Because if they don't understand that they have a voice that should be heard, it will continue to be silenced. And you're shaking your head because it's so easy to bury your head in the sand. We have some of our women from Paul Quinn College here. And I know when you think about uh, sexism, we also face racism. And racism is the, the, the evil that we continue to face in this country, but we also face sexism. We haven't even embarked on 100 years of the women having the right to vote in this United States. And our young women don't even know that. They don't know that women fought, died, and were thrown in jail for their right. And we continue to advocate that right because we are cowards as a nation because we do not realize our history. What are we, dead last here in Texas in voter turnout? It's horrific. We're talking about getting more women to run for office. We need more women to step up, and we need everybody to step up and just vote. And then the other thing I would point out on the, on the um, Me Too movement, I think we need to think like this as a chess game. Let's think beyond this current moment in time. We need to look back and we need to look forward. I can tell you one thing I have great concerns about, which is today's Me Too movement is tomorrow's exclu quiet exclusion moment, where all of a sudden, I'm a woman who owns a business. Oftentimes, I'm the only woman in a room full of men. How often is it, how much longer is this going to play out where I can't get a meeting with a man because they're worried about a Me Too accusation? And as a person who works in very confidential environments, this is a problem. So now the PR guy, who's not as good as me, gets to have the meeting with the highly influential decision maker, and I don't because they are afraid of the backlash from me too. Don't think, don't, don't think it won't, don't think it won't happen. Don't think it won't affect our business. It is a problem, but we need to think this through. So when those accusations are made, we need to stand together and be very clear about it. But we need to don't pretend this won't happen because it is already happening, number one. And looking back, I also want to point out, as a Senate staffer, oh my goodness, in the 90s, 
It just kind of things were there. But you know, in hindsight, I look at it, and I'm more upset not necessarily with some of the behavior from some of the gentlemen from, quite frankly, born in the previous century, but from the women who are just a little bit older than myself who knew what was going on and put young staffers in certain positions where certain things were occurring. We need to ask ourselves as super vigilant, how do we protect and set an example for those who are with us that we are essentially responsible for? So I know I may be bringing up things that are a bit contrarian, but I think we need to think this thing through beyond where it is because there are certain realities that exist. Unfortunately, we're running out of time and I'm gonna have to skip through a lot of questions, but I, I, I wanna make my last question, you know, a lot of times when I write about this issue, when I write about the disparity in representation at the Capitol in particular, um, I often hear from people who say, well, why do you make this about gender? Why does that matter when I'm choosing who to represent me? And I'm curious for, for each of you, you know, if you had to argue your case with those individuals, what, what would be your response? Is it that having more women in power changes the policies that are being considered? Is it that it changes the overall governing process? How does this play out in the courts? I'm curious and I think I'd like to have each of you all sort of give your response to folks who say that. We'll start with Representative Giddy. Well, I think it's, it's all of that. Um, I firmly believe that uh, in most cases, women have been raised to be nurturers and to try and bring people together, to try and find uh, that middle ground. Um, and uh, men, uh, it's a cultural thing on, on, the, uh, on the other hand. I mean, it's just the truth of the matter. They uh, are more, you know, absolutely my way or, or the highway and uh, not uh, enough of an attempt to find that middle ground. We also have a lot of issues uh, where women ought to have a voice and a perspective. One of the big issues that we had in Austin for the past two sessions is women's health. And we had men making the decisions uh, basically on women's health. So women ought to be there talking about women's health. Women ought to be there uh, talking about children. It is not that we can't deal with issues of, of defense. I, I think Kay Bailey Hutchison did a fabulous uh, job as, as senator, as a senator. But we definitely have a perspective and sometimes just being in the room. Some things won't get said and some things won't get done because there is uh, a woman in the room. And uh, I think having women there really makes all the difference in the world. Most of the time, we're the caregivers. So, I mean, we know what issues come up when it when it comes to getting children to the doctors and we're the sandwich people who are sandwiched between taking care of our children and taking care of our parents. That's going to change with the millennials, I think, but that's the reality of it right now. So who has more experience dealing with doctors? Who has more experience dealing with nursing homes? Who understands those issues uh, better? We're just as competent when it comes to uh, business but there are certain nuances and things that we bring to the table in terms of nurturing. I mean, one of the things personally, it's just not me, it's a whole bunch of people, you know, part of, a part of my legacy in the legislature will be that I could work with both sides of the aisle because to me it didn't care, I didn't care who brought the idea, whether it was a Republican or a Democrat or a woman or a man, uh, if it was a good idea, let's do it. And uh, men, uh, it's, it's a part of their culture, uh, and hopefully that's changing, but I'm just telling you like I see it. Um, women are more likely to try to find uh, the middle ground so that we can all move forward. I'll address it from the perspective of the justice system. The justice system sur survives because people respect the justice system. We're a rule of law society because people respect the justice system. The studies out there 
all point to the fact that women justices, women judges, don't rule differently than men on most of the cases that come before the court because justice is blind. So you don't have women coming to the bench you know, with a preconceived notion, I'm going to rule for women. But let me go back to the first point. The justice system survives because people have confidence in it. When our citizens see a bench that's diverse, uh, gender and ethnicity, that inspires confidence in the justice system. There is one area where women judges, their, their rulings are a bit different than, than those of men judges, and that's in the area of employment discrimination and also sexual harassment. Uh, statistically and empirically, women view those cases differently. But aside from that, women judges and male judges really don't differ. But the public needs to see a bench that looks like the public that we serve. In a word, effectiveness. So that's why you need to have more women in office. Prior to the 2016 election, they looked and said, well, out of all the caucuses in the US Congress, which one got the most legislation through that became signed through the US House and Senate, signed by the President? One caucus, by far, 60% of the legislation that passed. Not easy, the Women's Caucus. That's the kind of effectiveness that women bring, regardless of the side of the aisle. So that's ultimately the answer there. In an era where there's decreasing confidence, to your point, about our institutions and our ability of our lawmakers to get things done, these are the people who literally are the performers. And in this case, it happens to be a gender-based component. So that's why it's essential, it's what's there. Secondly, I then take it back into our communities. When you have women who are in, now in a position of authority and are in a position to make influence on policy, then women, when they say, we need to do something about this, we need to get involved, then there's that moment of saying, yes, and we are effective. See, yes, we are making a difference. We're not just waiting for the guys to make a decision and bring it on home to us so we can then live under that scenario. So that's why we need more women, is to boost the confidence in our institutions. And ultimately, at the end of the day, let's never forget what this country is. This country is extraordinary, it is exceptional, and it is the strongest living example of democracy in action. And we risk too much for it not to work. Do we see the best in politics out of people? No, we see some of the worst. We some, some, it's almost the point of theater in some points but it doesn't matter. We need to stay engaged, raise the bar, get involved on whatever level that may be and wherever you may be coming from in terms of perspective. It is all on our responsibility to do so. And I applaud all of you for being here in this conversation. And again, remember at the end of the day, how effective am I being? What can I do to pursue more politics so I can be even more effective or my best friend? That's ultimately what it comes down to. Dr. McClinton, I'll let you have the last word everything they said, but just to end, we make up 51% of this United States population, and less than 22% are at the table. What are we going to do about it? We work every day at night to train the next generation, and we believe that our young people are our future, and we believe that they can truly make a difference and step up. But we have to have representation at the table to impact policy, to be effective, and to demonstrate our democracy. And on a personal level, I'm personally offended, offended, disappointed in a country that I love. There are other countries, we're pretty much dead last when you compare us to other industrial Ask ourselves that question. I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to q and I'm not sure how much I'll try to get to as many questions as possible. And we'll start up here. Uh, oh, sorry, we'll start up there and then we'll come back to you. Please keep your questions as short as possible. We're trying to get people.
but I don't have the support, the big check writing support of the establishment. And I'm doing okay, but it's shocking to me how much money is in Texas politics. Right where, enough. for those of you who don't know, there are no restrictions on campaign donations. I think I'm gonna None. throw that one to Representative Giddings. Uh, well, let me try and answer that because I, I would have to, campaign finance is very, very broad. And I'm probably the wrong person to answer that because I've been in um, office for 25 years, soon to be 26. And I can count on one hand uh, the contributions that I've gotten that are $10,000. So I'm not somebody who, who gets uh, big campaign contributions. Uh, are you saying in the Texas House that we ought to limit it to $10,000 or $5,000, uh, such as we do in many of the mayoral can uh, uh, races? Uh, that, that's probably something that merits uh, really looking at. I think a larger issue is one that we tried to address on state affairs where I serve as vice chair. There is a lot of what we call dark money. We don't know who's giving it and we don't know where it's coming from. Uh, so in terms of do we need to get a better handle on that, uh, we have tried in the Texas House from state affairs to get a better handle on that. And I think there are probably a couple of lawsuits that are going uh, through the courts right now that are, are helping us, uh, that we're trying to, to get some help on in, in terms of, of that. We're going to go up here and then we'll go back there. Quick question for Margo. Um, it, can DACA or Dreamer students belong to Ignite? We accept all young women who want to participate in Ignite. We'll go back there um, to the young lady in the yellow shirt dress. <laughs> um, I have a question. So I'm trying to become a leader on my campus, and it is hard as a non-traditional to try to bridge the gap between where I am and current traditional students. Do you have any advice for people who are starting the process and who want to eventually become an elected official as far as on the college level? Well, get involved on your campus, and you can start a chapter at Polkland College. And we are also looking at creating an online program so you can look at the work that we're doing. But get involved on your own time. There's someone who just mentioned that she needs more help with her campaign. Go and volunteer. And you can make phone calls at your own time. There's so many ways to get involved. But starting by volunteering on a campaign, showing initiative on your campus by being a founder and president of a new organization, et cetera, et cetera, we can talk more. And there are young Republican and young Democrat organizations all over the state, so that's another, and, and on college campuses, so, and I know the age ranges, are, you know, there's some that are 18, there's some that are 27. So that's a really good way to get involved because then you're, you're learning from a lot of different people and you have an opportunity to impact different campaigns. So if you're thinking about politics, I would recommend one of those organizations also. I always say run a pretend campaign, okay? so. You want to go and you want to be elected to whatever position. When I went to University of Florida, go Gators, I decided I wanted to be part of the top three. I want to be president, vice president, or treasurer by the time I graduated. And so from day one, I started that campaign. So I volunteered on the organizations that, fed, that were the feeders. What are the feeders into those traditional things? Then what are the opportunities where there's completely something unexpected? In this case, we had a group of Soviets, yes, they were Soviets then, do an exchange with us for a week in tech in, in, the, in the state. Nobody knew what to do. I said, I am happy to show them the state, showcase this, the university, showcase what's going on here, and put together then a whole group of people around us. And at each point, and you guys, this is back when like you were dialing your, your landline. I kept the list, like Margot said. You keep that list and you help out. And then at that point, you're building that structure. And you literally say, I would like to be in that position. What advice do you have? Ask the person that's currently in that position and just say, if an opportunity comes open, please count me in. You don't even mean to be in the room. Count me in. I'm there. And I will tell you, this is the most important thing. At the end of the day, we're all going to see in the next couple of weeks, get out the vote. At the end of the day, the way that we managed to win was with 52 votes. 11 of them were guys on the basketball field 
that I pulled off the basketball court, asked them to vote, said I'd hold their court if they came back with their I voted stickers. I said, I don't even care how you vote. Now, of course, they didn't know anything about voting because they weren't really into that. So they recognized my name, bingo, there you are. That was 11 of those 52 votes. It is that cut and dry. Start running your micro campaign now. People will see you as a leader. You're the one crazy enough to put in the extra time. You will be in that position before you know it. A former SGA president at Paul Quinn had children. So you could be student government president at Paul Quinn College, run for office there on campus. I think we've got the mic back there. And unfortunately, folks, this might have to be our last question. There's no mic. Just speak really loudly. A group of women um, met who really care about this issue in Europe, and they talked a lot about that. And as of now, there has not been strong advocacy, but there is a coalition of women who are working together, who are like-minded, who know that we need to move the needle. So organizations like Ignite or uh, Higher Heights, who focus on African-American women, we know as women organizations, by ourselves, we cannot move this needle. So I think you're going to see more mobilization of like-minded organizations trying to figure this out. But if we don't have women at the table to propose that legislation, how are we going to even begin the conversation? If we don't have you win, um, tell me your name again. Beth, if you don't win, how are you going to propose legislation for campaign reform? So you have to, to win and get there. Well, uh, in addition to everything else in life, I'm the, I happen to be honorary consul for South Africa, the first honorary consul that they named in the world. I, I don't think they called it a quota. And as an African-American, quotas, that's always a red flag for me. So uh, I, I use the word goal. So they don't have a law, but the women themselves, there are about 27 or 28 parties the women themselves got together, which is why I was talking about women getting together and working for the better good. These women, regardless of their parties, got together and went back and pressured their parties and asked them to make sure that one out of four candidates on their ballot uh, was a, a female. And uh, they were more active, the women were in South Africa, than the men uh, in the political arena. The power in the ANC, uh, it's going to ride right now, but the power in the ANC really rests with the women's division. Uh, and then there's a Democratic Alliance and everybody else. So this was these women talking to uh, their counterparts about having a a cultural change, and, and there's really something about a cultural change that doesn't necessarily have to do uh, with quotas. And I'm a, I'm a sports fan, and I go back all the time when we start talking about these quotas, and I say, look back 25 years ago and tell me how many African-American quarterbacks you saw out there. It wasn't because they didn't know how to throw far. It wasn't because they didn't understand X's and O's or how to throw a post pattern uh, pass. It wasn't uh, any of that. It was because of the culture. And when Rooney, with the Pittsburgh Steelers, brought in the Rooney rule, it all changed. So now everybody wants a Dak Prescott or a Cam Newton or a Russell Wilson. And I could go on. And so what we have to have in this country in terms of women and race and gender and all that is a cultural change. And that starts with you and it starts with me. Folks, on that note, we are out of time. Emily's going to come back and give some closing remarks.